Hello and welcome back inside the park for May for podcast number 904. This is Todd. No, Todd, not now. A.K.A. Negative Camera. You know what we do on race weekends and you know why we do it? We watch one, then we talk about it. Then we watch one, then we talk about it. Come on, Todd. That's exactly what we do. And tonight we're going to review the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. How exciting is that? I'm awful excited, but I'm even more excited to introduce my co-host tonight. Rick! from out of the wasteland he's bad he's beautiful he's crazy it's hello everybody this is paul charles the the international paul yes it's exciting and you know why i'm excited i'm darned excited well is it next week (laughs) yes yes this weekend right yeah yep i'm awful excited about this week i know can't wait for this weekend yes so, so all of our listeners that go to the IMSA races, they've all got to hang out with you and chat. Yep. This weekend, Paul made it possible for me to tiptoe over to Indianapolis and sneak into the Heart of Racing area mm-hmm. and get an autograph from him. So I That's am right. so excited. I'm going to yeah. take my kit, see if he'll sign my shirt. Get in line, though. Take your turn. Don't. don't <laughs> I know. I know. Don't play, I don't line. play favorites. I know you don't. I'm going to have to get in line. and It's like Oliver. May I have some more, please? My hat. <laughs> I'm going to be out there you know, trying to get a signature from Paul. And yeah. I'm awful excited about it. Yeah, that. it's exciting stuff, right? You haven't yeah. seen an IMSA race for a while. Since it's Petit, been a while. Maybe for a Since few years. Petit. Yeah, Petit yeah. would be the last IMSA race I saw. And, and um, But this is different this year at Indy, right? It's a six-hour race. It is, yes. A longer race part of the Endurance Challenge as well. So it's an added yeah. race for that. But yeah, we've... We last year it was a sprint race, which is the first time we raced there, and then they they added it to the to a long distance race. Maybe Roger Penske wants to sell more fuel. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> either way, Roger either way, and I are like this. Yeah, just yeah, he's he's always stopping me in the paddock. Always. Yeah, I'm sure it's he's like, always I, probably ask, asking you how I how I'm doing and how I've yeah, been and yeah 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 yeah. Have you seen Todd? He just doesn't call anymore. <laughs> <laughs> He just doesn't call Say, well, anymore. you know, he's busy, family, you know, all that, Roger, yeah. you know. Yeah. Come on, Roger. What do you think? <laughs> I got time to call you every week? You know, I'm fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So here, I'm going to prove it, Paul. Yeah. I'm going to prove it in real time. Okay. If I can find it, I'm going to prove just how close Roger and I are. If I can find it in real time, I probably won't. But anyway, it was, it was, uh, well, here, here it is. For those watching on YouTube, here I am with Roger Penske. There we you are. are. You know, me and Roger, we're like this. Uh, I got. I got to say, I don't know how he is to right deal with. Right before the uh, security pulled you off him. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. So I'm. I'm hoping he'll call me tomorrow and wish me happy birthday. Yeah, I'm sure he will. Happy birthday, by the way. It's tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, perfect. Well, Mike right? Christian Horner it works perfectly. Yeah, that is perfect. Like the fi- it finally all came to. A- yeah. See? Peak. Yeah. It's all it perfect. all worked out. I learned that from Christian Horner all those years ago, you know, for, yeah. for just this this exact moment. So yeah. don't take those yeah. kind birthday wishes. No, know. no. If they're not on the day. Make sure they're correct. Yeah. Exactly. He's sending me WhatsApp maps or WhatsApp messages for some reason. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. That was not <laughs> that was that was a low blow. Um <laughs> It's just comedy, is it? Mm. Yeah, yeah, just just a little fun. Yeah, just having a little fun. If you can't laugh, you know. Yeah. So I'm awfully excited about going to IMSA, and I'm uh, equally as excited, Paul, to talk about the uh, the race in Baku. Yes. Tonight. Speaking of the subject of the day. A, potentially a four-way fight for the win there. It sure it was. was close. Yeah, well, it was a four-way fight till two of them disappeared but yeah yeah it was yeah. it was it was it was a it was a thrilling baku for sure it was. i mean it's yeah. just kind of adding on to the whole season of how competitive all these cars and, yeah. and even um, the mercedes wasn't even in the mix but uh yeah. you know, know but um yeah the this season is pretty crazy on how tight the field is for sure it's so funny because in our fantasy gp this has just been my year in fantasy mm-hmm. No matter what I do, I called, I had it on my GP for the win. I had Lando, mm-hmm. Charles Leclerc, George Russell. 
Wow. Now I missed Lando. Two of the three, yeah. Two of the three. I had fast lap. Mm -hmm. I had points scored. I had the right number of safety car, virtual safety car. Okay. All that didn't move one spot in the fantasy GP. Well, strategy, man. I can't tell you. I'm... I even have Williams as one of my teams. They're both in the points. And I have McLaren as one of my teams. They're both in the points. I have both. Uh, McLaren. I, I'm done. <laughs> well, I can I'm tell done. you, if, if Perez hadn't have crashed, I would have. I would have made up a lot of ground this weekend. Yeah. I, I, I moved up one spot. I mean, P5 or P6 or something. Yeah, I know but, you uh, did. But I had yeah. I had Perez as one of my drivers, and man, I, know. I was just a, a lap and a half short of really rubbing it in everyone's faces. It's it's like you and Grace. I mean, you guys could pick both Bodas and, and Guan Yu and <laughs> Yuki for the podium. Yeah. And you'd still gain tons of points, and I don't know how you do that. Well, I, well you know. I think you're slipping on a fiver. I don't know what's going on. You guys got to be. I got painful. some very good engineers at the heart of racing that can hack into computers and change points. <laughs> You're in there like Ferris Bueller changing your grade. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, yeah, it's un ups it's it's unsettling. I got to tell yeah, you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but you know, <sighs> rules are the rules. Rules are the rules. So let's talk about Baku, shall we? It's a toddle in town, city of fire. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Born from the crucible of strife. Yes, lovely. So I'm sure there's a perfectly legitimate explanation for that title, mm. and I'm just not aware of it as an American. Yep. Purposely obtuse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's a challenging track, though, Paul. It's uh, first on the calendar in 2016. Remember, remember all you veterans out there when it came on, it burst onto the seam, labeled as what? The European Grand Prix. Remember those days? Oh, yeah. Remember? You had the Jersey Barrier uh, Grand Prix in Valencia that was called the European Grand Prix. Capital yeah, it used to bounce Fernando around, Lanza. didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it did. And it would move around to wherever, you know, it was in Germany, right? when Schumacher was hot, then it was over in Spain when Fernando was hot. And then it went to Azerbaijan. <laughs> I was like, there's no driver over there. What, why is that the European Grand Prix? And, and is that, while technically Europe, it's not, it doesn't jump to mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. They used to have but, it way back when, when, when Brands Hatch used to be an yeah. F1. We used, to, we used to have Brands Hatch and Silverstone on the same yeah. years F1 races. Right, so that jumped around. Well, that lasted all of 12 months, and then they yep. rebranded it the Azerbaijan Grand yep. Prix in Baku. Um, easy for you to say. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah Easy. Um, a very long straight, and they increased the DRS zone this year. And... So there, and there's some very tight and twisty parts, you know, the, or the old section with the castle and how narrow that track is there. Very difficult. Um, I thought it was interesting. Uh, they had uh, one Jacques Villeneuve on the Sky Sports Did they, uh, this yeah. weekend. I wasn't on the And Sky everybody was cringing, but I actually thought he had some pretty insightful stuff this weekend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was talking just more from a driver. You know, he can be a little cagey. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's no different than having Nico Rosberg on there, right? Um, Hopefully, it, it's different. <laughs> well, Jacques was, and I do say? think there's times that Nico is very insightful from a driving perspective. Yeah. So, you know, maybe maybe the Sky Crew kind of kept Jacques on the driving thing and less politics, and that went mm -hmm. well. But when they were at that tight bit at the castle, he was talking about yes, the elevation change is pretty significant there, going up that hill. Mm -hmm. But he said the real difficult thing is is the sight line. For the drivers, because the bollards all on the Tech Pro are all the same color, yeah, and you can't. It's difficult to measure distance I'll distinguish, away. Distinguish, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. um, because it's a blind corner. So all you're seeing is that bollard, that hoarding advertising, going into the corner, which automatically blends with the the counterpoint going across the end of the curve up right. the hill, and it's difficult, you know, to get your yeah, on. and and that's kind of part of what we always talk about street circuits is getting your eye in. And that's mm -hmm. why Monaco, it's very important to get laps, 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 laps. Um, because you, on street circuits especially, things get a little grayed out a little bit. So you, you've got to get drive-by sight pictures. So if, mm -hmm. if the bollards are the same, then you, can't, then you have to use some information from 
further out to make sure your alignment and your trajectory and speed are correct for where you are. And that's mm -hmm. why you, you can't just jump in and go, oh, I'm going to take this flat. You've got to build up that brain history of going around the track to kind of build those pictures up at a very, obviously when you're driving a, a race car as fast as you can, that it's got to be very accurate. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, oh, well, I'll turn around here. It's going to be very accurate. So that that's why it's, driving by sight picture is is important. Um, breaking zones are fairly easy on street circuits because usually there's, you know, you've got the, the sign boards and usually pretty straight braking zones, et cetera. But yeah, on those tight where everything's going back and forth and there's not one line, that's super, super important. Yeah, um, yeah. Another, another thing is, you know, driving street circuits um, probably wouldn't really appeal that much to a Jacques Villeneuve type who was willing to always go above and beyond. You know, I'll, I'll yeah. take a Rouge flat, flat. Uh, till we run out of spare cars, right? right. Um, and I was thinking, look, why is Sergio better here than in other places? And it's because there's certain drivers that need the ability to hang it out just that little bit more. And are mm -hmm. willing to take those risks, like the maxes and et cetera, right. on road courses. But when you're on a street course, that gets taken away from you. So you have to be, right. you have to drive within maybe what your capabilities are, keep the car in one piece, and and maybe that's where Sergio's abilities really pay off. You know, he's mm -hmm. he doesn't have that little extra that the maxes have. But right. what he does have is the ability to be repetitive and and drive within those limits a little bit, which probably keeps him back from scoring all pole positions. But I think that kind of benefits him at this circuit. It's a really good point because he does tend, you know, he's the only repeat winner here. Right. And he does tend to do well here. And I remember his debut in Monaco. He was just absolutely stunning. And and seems to thrive in that. That's a good point. You know, on a map, I look at this track and it doesn't get my heart racing. It's just kind of yeah. like square, and then there's some yeah, twisty bit, no... and it doesn't really look that great. Yeah. But I'm sure the driver's heartbeat is racing. I think it is a lot more difficult in real life and, and in racing. And even when you watch the race, it's impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, you'd be forgiven for not thinking it would be that great of a race looking at a map, you know? Right, right. And it's it's a little different from Singapore where – you know what I don't like about Singapore is is the is the change of pace and stop start nature of it, where yeah, it's hard yeah. to build a rhythm. This one isn't yeah. so bad because you've got the long straight, but that's basically a straight. Yeah. Um, and you've got a couple of that. The downhill left is obviously the most hard corner because not because of the actual corner itself, but the approach to it and under braking and the cars loaded up and one slight lock up and you're going to lose some of the front tire grip and you go into the wall. Um, so it's. It's not as difficult as said as Singapore, so I think the drivers can attack it pretty good, but obviously mm -hmm. still that first section kind of flows from one to the other to the other, so they're always in that mindset of I'm between the walls, I've got to be accurate, et cetera, till they get out onto the on yeah. down by the water and then they can like let loose. So it keeps your focus in the same frame of driving that you that the car demands, you know? Yeah. That makes and sense. I I th it does, and I thought interestingly this uh, this Paul much like. Do you remember the Frick system or the asymmetrical braking which they mm -hmm. put a stop to this year, like the dual diffuser or Mercedes? Remember when they had the DOS? You know, yes, that whole thing. Well, this year's buzzword coming out of this weekend, and all everyone's talking about is a term called Mini DRS. As if DRS wasn't controversial <laughs> enough. Now we have the Mini DRS. And isn't that exemplified by McLaren? And some people wondering, Paul, if that flexion of the front flap mm -hmm. on that is moving up, if that didn't play a role in keeping Oscar ahead of Charles yeah. for the rest of the race. So lots of discussion going on. Um, and, you know, this, this whole aeroelasticity issue has been for years and always will be. Yeah, major for issue for Formula One. It just yeah. plagues Formula One, and and um, you know, enterprising engineers, you know, figuring out how much composite is needed or how much material is needed to pass the FIA test, but then, you know, experience that flexion at a higher load, right? Right, and, right. I uh, mean, how they lay the carbon. Mm -hmm. that, that's like a black art for sure. How yeah, they lay the sure. carbon in the wing. 
really changes how how the yeah. wing bends and flexes for sure. How it performs, yeah, yeah exactly. And so they're chasing that. So, you know, keep your eye on that heading into Singapore. It may still be a talking point, but, you know, I'm sure teams, and this is the way Formula One normally is, you have the, the teams that are doing something similar to that, and then you have the ones that aren't. So it's the haves and the have-nots. And the have-nots generally, you know, start to lodge a complaint that they question the legality of that, right? right. Um, and whether that's legal or not. So I don't know if it's a, oh, boy. That's really clever. Why don't we do that sort of thing? Or if a hey, that's against the regulations, and we're going to we can't afford plan. to do that, so and we can't afford to do that, so yeah. we need to get it banned, right? Yeah. Uh, so we'll see. Heading into Singapore, well, let's talk about the race. It was an exciting race. Oh. Uh, it was won by Oscar Pastry and P1 McLaren uh, and uh, Lando Norris's teammate in P4. With all the talk about, you know, are they going to favor Lando this weekend? All of that was put to bed on Saturday, leaving Oscar to really make a bold pass on Charles Leclerc uh, after his pit stop. He then set about harvesting and deploying, which I think he was doing with a plum. The amount of harvesting and where to deploy and how, I thought he was doing perfectly uh, to keep the Ferrari behind him. And I was wondering, you know, much like that, that beginning, that opening stint, I was wondering uh, if he wouldn't cook his tires like he did on the first stint, as the Ferraris are typically good on their tires, and this would leave Oscar a little vulnerable. But that didn't happen. In fact, it was quite the opposite. And being the the ridiculous Ferrari fan I am, I was thinking, okay, you got to run Charles. Okay, but... You know, Ferraris typically have tire sympathy. They're good on their tires. Oscar, McLaren, they're, while they're good, I wouldn't have put them in the same category as Ferrari. And so I was thinking just, you know, a number of laps towards Ooh. the end of the race, Charles will start to push. Oscar's tires will be cooked and Charles will get around. But that's not what happened at all, Paul. It ends up Oscar spent two thirds of the race defending from McLear in what he called the hardest race of his life, and that warranted driver of the race accolades from fans. And oh, and he ignored his engineer's advice to take it easy when he made that pit stop on fresh rubber, and he lunged down the inside of McLear yeah. to make that pass for the win. It was yeah. great. Yeah, it was a fantastic result for Oscar. Yeah, no, it it really was. I mean, the guy's. I think I texted you. He's a robot. I mean. Don't see a lot of emotion from from him. He's very driven, you know. Mm -hmm. Don't mistake him not being jubilant and jumping around and, you know, high fiving everybody. He's he's not seriously determined to be a world champion, um, but he's just going about it a different way than some of the others do. I mean, for him to be able to hold Leclerc off for that long, he had to be inch perfect every lap, as you say, really managing deployment to be able to. Use it when when he needed it, which was obviously in in the DRS zone down that down that front straight. You would think he was he was just going to get repassed straight away, but he he ran it perfectly. And remember the middle sector where Norris was told to hold up um, Perez. Perez, yeah. you know, I mean that's the place where he starts harvesting the energies where Leclerc can't get by him, and then deploys it down the straight. And obviously, perhaps the the McLaren inherently is a bit faster on the straight anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't, I don't know how he could have ran it any better. And yeah, making that move, sometimes drivers have to do that, right? I mean, they, they know as much as we say, well, the drivers can't call the strategy. They don't have all the information. Well, the crews or the engineers don't always have all the information of what the driver can feel on, in his fingers and on his butt and what he thinks the car can actually physically do, you know, mm -hmm. even going against the data that, that, that they apply to it. And, and that's exactly what he did. I, I remember one race I was was just about to pass a guy to win and then the guy came on the radio and said, no, not yet, wait. And I'm like, and and and, and, and uh, that split second of hesitancy, I didn't make the move at that point and I, I knew I had it, right? Um, yeah. It was like two laps from the end and then a bunch of lap traffic got in the way. I didn't win the race. I could have won the race if I just stuck with my guns. And that's exactly what Oscar did. He, he stuck to his guns. He He's learning and learning and learning. This is only, what, a year and a half in Formula 1? Uh, yeah, second season. And, uh, man, I mean, we he's he's going to be formidable. I mean, I think he they is. always brandish future world champion, blah, blah, blah. but, I mean, I think he's going to be a force. No, he's a cut above. You can tell it. And and the guy that told you to wait, he know, 
he never worked in motorsport again, did he? <laughs> yeah, the, they never found the body. They never yeah. found him, did they? <laughs> <laughs> He's in the concrete pouring of some bridge in London or yes, Miami or wherever yeah. that happened. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So no, he is. He is a kind of. Did you happen to catch? And I really thought if you guys haven't seen the interview, um, I don't know if it was F one's website that did. I, I'm sorry, guys. Whoever the host of the interview. I should know this. I think it was. But anyway, they interviewed Adrian Newey at Aston Martin, you know, the day of the announcement. And they, they spent, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes with him. And it was interesting interview. But there was a part in there, and he's taken some flack about it. I don't exactly know why. He's worked with Max for Max's entire career. So nobody mm-hmm. would know Max better than Adrian or Christian, et cetera. But Adrian is saying that Max is misunderstood. Um, you know, they think, you know, there's some stuff that he's dumb or whatever. He's like, he is anything but dumb. Um, but he made this comment that I thought was interesting about Formula One drivers. What he was saying about Max is that you, there are drivers on the grid that have so much mental capacity beyond what they're currently engaged in. And what he was saying is when you're in the fight, in a race, going at it, hammer and tongs, some drivers, that's all they can mentally handle. They're they're hanging on, right. you know, for their very lives, and they can't process anything beyond that hammer and tongs fight for their lives. Mm-hmm. But there are other drivers that, that their mental depth and capacity goes way beyond what they're currently doing in the car. Right. And he said that Max is one of those guys. I think Schumacher was one of those guys. And um, it was definitely one of those guys. And it was definitely one of those guys. Yeah. You know, Schumacher would get out and say he was reading the, you know, the the large signs and yeah, reading exactly. ga- lap times when they didn't have them on the steering wheels and stuff. Um, but I do think Oscar is one of those guys. I think he's got that capacity beyond what he's engaged in. And I think, uh, yeah, I think that's for real. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's when, when the limit of the car is below the limit of the driver, that's when the yeah. champions are made, right? Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, literally, just because you're at the at the edge of the car does not mean you should actually not have any capacity for anything else. And that, that really does. It plays off really well. And that's why the good endurance races stay the good endurance races, because they've got lots of capacity to see the 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 forest for the trees and they can see the, the ice as we talk about Gretzky, but yep. yeah, it's, it's definitely a big deal to be in sync with the car enough where you do have an extra capacity to make different decisions, which Hamilton has all, all the top, yeah, all the all top do. guys do. Yeah. Yeah. And Adrian made the comment. You can just look them down the grid and see who does and doesn't have it. Yeah. And who's, who's world champion potential and who's not. Right. Now this, the silly thing is the follow up question should have been, okay, tell us who does and who doesn't <laughs> you know, yeah, they didn't yeah. ask him that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, and that's, that's where consistency is built. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, even, mm-hmm. even in like sports car racing, you've got gentlemen drivers, sometimes they can throw down a lap. Yeah. They may not have known how they did it, but there's no, but it's the consistency comes from being within your limits, you know, with, with still using the car at, at its utmost. I would think like in your team, you know, that's why you think of like drivers like Ross or Mm -hmm. Alex, you know, it's that consistency, that capacity to see beyond. Because in endurance racing, you know, if Ross is driving a stint in that that Aston Martin, when he gets out, that's somebody else's car. He can't show up with it totally destroyed and the brake pedal touching the floor, right? right? So he's he's got to think beyond what stint he's in. He's got to think of your strategy that you want him to do, his strategy, how the car feels. There's yeah. so much going on yeah. in the mind of those drivers sitting in your Aston Martin, plus your mind, your strategy, your chief engineers and your team trying to radio, you know, the, what to do and pit stop strategies. And there's so much going on. And those great drivers can take all of that in a 360 ability to read the entirety of that race, to understand where they are, in that race, even though they don't visually see the whole race like we do on timing and scoring and maps and stuff. Yeah. And it's impressive. Yeah. And, that, and those kind of drivers usually don't get involved in incidents as much either because they do have that capacity while mm-hmm. still that limit to see where everyone is and kind of judge, you know, what what's going to happen next, so to speak. Remember talking to Alan McNish all those years yes. ago. Yes. 
you know, very much of the same ilk. Very much, very yeah. much. And I think in Oscar's case, Paul, you know, he's still young. He's been, what, 18 yeah. months, right? So That's crazy. he's still young and he's yeah. winning races and he's applying his skills. It didn't didn't take him very long. You know, a lot of drivers that come into Formula One really struggle with tire, tire management. The tires are unlike anything else they've driven and brakes yeah. and et cetera. But, you know, he kind of cut his teeth last year. This year he's been on it. Um, he'll He's going to make mistakes still. But the reality of it is, if he's this good now, I mean, when you juxtapose him in his second season versus Max in his second season, I know he's a little older than Max was at the time. Mm -hmm. And other great drivers, you know, that came in, he is right there with all of them, right there with all of the greats, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, and and you don't, until you gain the experiences, it's not in your toolbox. Yeah, you don't And so that's what time takes. Yes. You know, there's, Yeah. yeah, you could read the, what's going on with the suspension and everything, but those little things like that move that he made, you know, that's a, that's something he's learned as he's gone along in his last few races right. and learned what he's capable of and what the tires are capable of and what he can get away with. You know, he was worried about, you know, taking the sheen off the tires and being vulnerable, but he's, he's, he's gauged such a good understanding of it now that that was a premeditated, you know, thoughtful decision, not just a, God, there's a gap. I'm going for it. He, right. he, he was thinking a long and hard before he made that move and knew right, that he right. could get away with it. Yeah. You know, it's, it, and it's a great point about a toolbox. You know, if you never had the tool, then you didn't know when to use it or, or anything like that. But once you learn that, you've got the tool in your toolbox yeah. and you're like, so that's how you get an oil filter out. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was in there with, a, you know, channel grips and, t- you know, tearing it up. And so when you figure that out and you know how to apply it later and where, you know, it mm-hmm. worked. And uh, I think that's that's very true. And it takes all of these guys uh, time. And it's also got to be a challenge. This is why I think it's always a challenge for guys like Total Wolf, who's looking at Kimi Antonelli. Does he have enough tools? Has he got enough tools from Junior Series in there yeah. that he can manage in F1? And or... the truth is, probably not. But, right. you know, right. when, that's why, you know, as you're saying, Oscar's a little little older than when Max started in F1. Yeah. But he had, but he, he was racing all that time. Max yeah. got kind of thrown into it. His natural skill, his ability, they couldn't resist it. They had to keep pushing him up. He won his first race driving a Red Bull. Uh, right. But we, we kind of saw his growing pains a little bit at the beginning, right? And, and, and Oscar's kind of jumped in a little further up the ladder of experience. I agree. And so he's not going to make some of the mistakes that Max made at the beginning. I agree. Yeah. Let's talk about Lando. Lando. Uh, Lando. I love how Zach Lando. says Lando. Lando. Yeah. I don't even know anyone in the world that pronounces it like that. I don't either. It's a Zachism. Uh, Lando had a lot of work to do, but he started on hards, made his way into the points, and then even held up uh, Sergio Perez to allow Oscar to avoid the undercut, which I think is, you know, a great team move on his part. Lando then made the pass late on Max to take a points gain against Max, his closest rival in the driver's championship, as well as to combine with Oscar's win. And this means that McLaren leave uh, Baku with just 59 points between Lando and Max in the driver's championship. But most importantly, they are now 20 points ahead in the constructors championship. They've taken the lead over that, um, leaving Red Bull and Helmut Marco to suggest, yeah, we're constructors at this point. Um, it's like, oh, okay. Uh, goodbye, good luck, and good riddance. Okay, Helmut, there you go. It's over. It's over. Game over. Um, yeah. So anyway, so maybe uh, they should have changed their driver line up a lot sooner. Maybe. maybe. Um, so a, a huge weekend for McLaren, and I don't want to overplay this, but I don't want to understate it either. So every position in the drivers' championship is worth tens of millions of dollars, and with that comes a little success ballast, right? You get less wind tunnel time, et cetera, et cetera. But but McLaren, as a customer team, folks of Mercedes has risen in the last 18, 24 months to take the lead in the Constructors' Championship, and it's a Herculean effort by all the men and women of Woking. I couldn't be happier for him, so it's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as Lando says, you know, or even Oscar maybe said it, you know, at the beginning of last season, they are literally the last car on the grid. Yeah, right. 
a miraculous turnaround and there's the little adjustments here and there. They haven't had, it wasn't clean sailing all the way to the top, but now they've kind of got that magic button in the car. Um, yeah. They, and they, Paul, they did it without an Adrian Newey. They did do it without an Adrian yeah, so it's, Yeah, but, but they, they were helped by Red Bull quite a lot, I believe. The turmoil yeah. at Red Bull, the yeah. driver choices at Red Bull, I think, I, you know, you got to give 50-50 um, to, to McLaren overachieving and Red Bull underachieving from what they should have been doing the whole year, right? Shouldn't shouldn't be this close, quite yeah, honestly. Max was nice. He'd send a portion of the Constructors' Championship prize money to Christian. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. stubbing your toe there, Chief. But, yeah, so, so Lando did a great job mm-hmm. um, coming from the back. Um, still McLaren a little suspect on strategy call in in the race fine but in the qualifying you know yeah not 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 good to to assume there was a the the, the times were just tumbling at that point and and they got called out so that once again another lesson learned within the team they're still you know lear, relearning how to be a winning team i think and that was another another thing you can't be complacent even in q1 yeah I agreed. Um, and yeah lando holding up Sergio, that was essential, I think, for crucial the yeah. Austria to to win the yeah. race. Yeah, for sure. For the, the, sure. the Red Bulls were literally the fastest car on the track, I believe, but um, they managed to fight their way to the back. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about Ferrari, Charles Leclerc P two, Carlos Sainz at DNF. Leclerc led from pole, and the question was: Have Ferrari's upgrades been good across? all tracks or were they kind of Monza specific, which you would understand as their home Grand Prix. I think Paul, I think it would seem to be that they are a net positive across the remaining or the balance of the season. But Oscar managed to take the lead from Charles admitting and Charles admitted that he didn't defend hard enough. He should have defended harder than that. And this left the Monegasque hounding Oscar for two thirds of the race all the way to the end. I was thinking that his tires and Ferrari's tire sympathy may pay dividends late in the race, as I mentioned earlier. And there was a moment when they seemed to, but he just couldn't get around him. And at that point, I think Charles cooked his rears and couldn't get around Oscar and was at this point really at even at risk of being passed by Sergio Perez and his own teammate, Carlos Sainz, until their collision. Um, And so... He hung in there. He had that unforced error, you know, where he put it in the barrier early in the weekend. And the team got the car put back together, did a fantastic job. Yeah, you feel like maybe he left the door open too much on the pass from Oscar. I don't know. Um, yeah. I thought he could get back around him, but... It just went in the cards. It's not to say that I think Charles had a bad weekend. I think he did a great job, but he wasn't happy. It's not what they wanted. They they were really looking uh, to win. No, I mean, it's tough to say. I mean, we I we would have thought he would have also got by back by again, right? I mean, it it wasn't a bad decision in that case. It's like, hey man, if you want to go for it, go for it. Yeah. But you know, I'll, I'll get you in a couple of laps. But ultimately, you know, the the brilliance of Piastri thwarted that. Um, you know, they go out on the tires and it's, it is important to build temperatures and everything up evenly and don't overcook the tires in those first two laps. Cause it really can, um, be detrimental to the, to the car over the stint. And, and that's exactly what he was doing. So he wasn't panicking. Um, yeah. and understandably so I, th- I thought we could DRS by him again, but uh, I think o- Oscar Piastri obviously had other ideas. So that's, that's why Charles is obviously very disappointed i mean for a second place um because when, when you have those moments when you have a, a race win right in your pocket and just one splits his decision you know makes the difference and takes it away from you it's it's something that that probably you know just really irks him quite a quite a lot i would say yeah and he said that it was really down to his outlap he said that his yeah. tires they just took a long time to come in but the McLarens, he said, for whatever reason, it did not take that amount of time for their tires to come in. Yeah. You know, and he said that was really one of them. And there was some consideration that once his tires had fallen off the cliff, that he may have been, you know, backing up Perez into mm-hmm. signs at that point, trying to get Carlos to hobble Sergio's efforts, prevent him from getting around Charles. And then, you know, we know what happened. But, yeah. um, but it may have been his only 
card to play at that point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, firing the tires up is is definitely a choice sometimes by the engineering side as much as by the driver, right? Tire yeah. pressures, cambers, everything like that. You can you can set your car up to light the tires up on lap one, but usually it's detrimental in lap ten, fifteen, whatever. So sometimes you go a little more conservative just for the big picture, and and that's mm -hmm. obviously what McLaren maybe track position was more important at that point in the end. You know, I mean, if if uh, Piastri is holding every hold, holding back, gaining energy and just making that long straight, you know, unachievable for Charles, he's just going to try this and try that and just eat away at his tires anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, which is yeah. what happened. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Carlos, Carlos had a bit of a quiet race really until the penultimate lap, and yeah. you know, he had the uh, tire grip to spare. Unlike Charles, I think Charles' rears were gone. Carlos was really coming on pretty strong in the waning laps of the race. Um, charged forward towards Perez. Once he got to Perez, he made, um, uh, you know, he went for the pass, went down. He was on the outside as it came out of turn two. They were side mm -hmm. by side coming out of T. Uh, and then they collided with each other. Carlos said that uh, he was basically, he left plenty of room for Sergio. And he said, basically, he was very slowly drifting back towards the racing line, which is the center of the track. And he left plenty of room for Sergio and he didn't understand why they collided or why they hit. Um, Sergio said that he thought that Carlos may have been, he was, Carlos was going to try to slip in behind him and get the slipstream on him. And that he was, <laughs> that, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> all right, I'm not. I'm not justifying. I'm just saying. Yeah. He he thought Char Carlos was maybe caught out about how quickly he came over, um, and came into it. So, but anyway, how did you see it? Because the steward said it's a racing incident and yeah. uh, no penalties. How did you see it? I, I I would call it a racing incident, but I I still think Sergio has a bit more percentage in this play. I mean. As you, as you rightly said, the natural line for someone coming off that corner is then to make their way back to the middle where the track is cleaner. You know, you're setting yourself up for the next corner. Obviously, when you're fighting tooth and nail with somebody, you're not, you know, waving them by and waving them through. You you, you want to, you don't want to make it easy and you want to try and move people over. It happens every racetrack in the world, you know, in, in any race where you do that, you come off the corner, someone's side by side, you try and move them over a little bit. And Sergio, for whatever reason, didn't move an iota on the steering wheel. If he had just, as you saw, and it wasn't an abrupt move by Sainz either. It wasn't it like he suddenly, me. He, he just eased his way over. And for some reason, Sergio didn't react to it at all. Right. Um, normally, if someone's coming over, you're like, you give up till... You can't give up anymore. I mean, you, you, everyone's driving with elbows out with three laps to go, right? I mean, that's just going to happen. But you also have to give a little bit so you just don't end up in a crash every time you put your elbows out. And I think Sergio just kind of tried to play the hard man, and it wasn't time to do it. Yeah, you can't go in there with a win it or bend it attitude at this point. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if he, he did that. He, You know, as I said, it's, it's not that egregious, but... He did have an option. He had a whole another lane to the left as Sergio was moving over naturally to the Carlos. better line for the track. So, yeah, um, yeah Carlos. So, I, as I said, I, I, I'm, I don't think he deserved a penalty for it, but I also think he could have avoided it with just a little bit more heads up thing. It's it all to do with Sergio's year, right? He's trying to make things happen. And he had the car. He had the car. You know, he's he's out there to try and win the race. He felt like he had a car that was capable of winning the race, and he was just trying. Carlos was just the next step in the rung to get get up. Um, yeah. But he's he's. I, I still think it's a mental thing with him, not not being able to see enough of how things are going to play out. Um, it's a shame because you consider this was his best race in what eighteen months. Yeah, it really was. It was and great. It he was, he out qualified Max. He yeah. he raced hard. He was he was. You know, get definitely going to be on the podium, and, and and it all went away in just a split second of, you know, trying to be a little too hard there. I think in that yeah. in that place at that time. The greed. But we'll talk about Sergio more in a minute. Um, mm. Let's talk about Mercedes, shall we? Why not? I feel like Mercedes should be talked about. Get down. Um, you had Lewis Hamilton down P nine, George Russell in P three. George had a bad start. 
um, and set in for a lonely race. Drove a, a very good stint on his hards, though. Once he got onto the hard compounds, he said they really kind of transformed his car. He was setting competitive pace with the leaders, got up in amongst it, was there. Um, he he said that the mediums were a second off the pace, but once he got on the hards, he was really a, quite a transformed car. George was able to use that grip to get past Max, and then he was set for a P5 until he inherited a podium when Sergio and, and Carlos uh, collided. But, you know, Paul, this isn't the first time he's done that. George seems to be able to put himself in those positions that, you know, if something comes up, something happens, he's there, you know? Yeah. And it's not how you want to get on the podium, but it's happened before. And I kind of feel like it's kind of a lesson. Keep yourself in the hunt. I think Absolutely. you've got to be there. And I don't think there was any moment, whether he was a second off the pace or not, I don't think there was any moment in that race that George wasn't hunting for a podium to keep himself in contention. And you never know when attrition will happen or where it will happen. And it did, and it benefited him. So I yeah. think it's a legit piece. Yeah, you've got to maximize the car you, the cars you've been given yeah. in each day. And some drivers do turn off. Yeah. Right, if it, the car isn't great, if they got a bad start, they're in a bad position, etc. You know, they they their intensity level goes down. Their maybe maximum lap time overall yeah. goes down. Right, and 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 that's exactly what you shouldn't do because you just don't know what's going to happen. In Schumacher front of you. should have taught you. Yeah, taught us yeah. That. yeah. You just got to always be ready. Yeah, you got to have that intensity, and 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 it it. it it sets you up for the times when you're leading a race to keep that intensity as well. Right. It's it's a mental mental game when when you're driving around on your own that you're still maximizing the car. You're not switching off and just kind of coasting. You just can't afford to do that. And opportunities don't arise if you don't. Uh, always talk to our drivers about that. Um, just keep pushing. You don't know what's going to happen. They're messing around right. up front. Things are happening. Just stay in the hunt. If if something happens, people come off and. You lose a couple of seconds all of a sudden you're there but if you thought all was lost and you just kind of backed off and were cruising to to the finish line that opportunity may never have opened itself up to you right right yeah you know and so you look at like lewis you know what how motivated is 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 a multi-champion like lewis to start from pit mm. lane and turn around well not much but he was going at it pretty damn hard watching his car yeah. and and he's pretty intense in that car, and he was not happy with the car and not happy with the weekend for sure. And he said they made a, a car change on Saturday, and they were kind of stuck with it uh, for the mm -hmm. balance of the weekend. But irrespective, he ends up finishing the points. So he went from pit lane to P9 in the yeah. points, which is good um, to get a couple points. But anyway, um, it's tough to have that intensity and keep that going. Uh, for that length of time, but it's a really good point you make. If you can stay back running in P five, six, seven, and go at it like you're killing snakes, and with that intensity and passion for seventh place, mm -hmm. then when you are leading a race, it'll come natural to you. You know, right, a right, more exactly. natural anyway. Yeah, and it's it's harder. Fernando for, does that. It is, and it, that's why that's why it's harder. It's more amazing that Fernando and Lewis keep going. Yeah, with that because the years. You get worn out, you know, and, yeah. and it's hard to be 100% intense. You know, I'm, I'm a, uh, all the time. It's, 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 yeah. it's fatiguing, you know, yeah. it's draining. Right. Um, and, and the turnovers, the long, more races you're in, the, you know, the shorter the winter is, it's even harder to do that recovery and get yourself, okay, let's go again. You know, yeah. I, yeah, I find yeah. myself in the same place sometimes when, you know, I'm going from this track to that track to this track to that track. You know, I'm doing as I think I'm doing as many races as the F1 circus is doing at this point, and it, it, it. But you just got to wake up in the morning and just just bring it. You walk through yeah. that paddock and you go, hell yeah, let's go. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, let's talk about Red Bull. Sergio Perez. Do you like my face? Do you like it? I did. <laughs> Don't like your choices, but yeah, your pace. Fine. I did, Sergio and Matt. He DNF Max for stopping P5. As we mentioned, Sergio had a good start, jumped Carlos Sainz and was running in P3 for most of the day, biding his time, managing his tires, which he's generally pretty good at. He had pace for a podium, for sure, possibly a win. I was going to pounce on Charles until he and Carlos came together at turn two. We've talked at length about that, so we won't re readdress that here. Um, 
Yeah. Anyone you want to add on Sergio before we move to Max? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, the big thing, I, I think actually Carlos and Sergio could have actually run to the front. Yeah. Their I cars were in better pl pl place, you know? Um, yeah. Maybe it was a bit late, but th those two actually were, were actually flying at the end versus yeah, they were. Charles and Oscar who had nearly worn, worn each other out, right? So, right. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what to say about Sergio. <laughs> you mm. know, I mean, he, he did great. He drove very well this whole he weekend. Did. Can he can he take that and create something more positive going into the next race? I know this the incident was a massive negative. Um and I don't know how the team treat him after that. I know they you know on the books they say, Oh well we blame uh, Carlos, you know, uh but in the end, you know, you're always gonna have that little bit of well, Sergio, did you really need to play yeah. you know, hard man right there? We were in such a good position, we wouldn't have lost right. the chat, the manufacturer's lead if that happened. So I know, yeah, it's brutal. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Max was off all weekend, and although he jumped Russell at the start, he lost that position in a position to his nearest rival in the in the shape of Lando Norris. Max struggled with no bite on the front end, brake issues, grip issues. It's shocking to me to see how far these developments have moved that car away from Max. And I'm as perplexed as the team, apparently. I, the team's collective head must be sore from scratching it so much. I have no idea what's going on over there. Um, or, you know, I, if you can't, if Max can't get in the car on the weekend and beat Sergio, there's something way off, yeah. way off, you know? Um, and, I would argue it's not Max's motivation. Um, he's never not motivated to win. Yeah. I just, I don't know what's going on. And you got to ask yourself at this point, are they, Paul, are these the moments giving all the intra team drama, all the poaching that's happened? Because they've lost a lot of wind tunnel time. Mm -hmm. You know, they had all, you know, I guess, is this, is this, the time that kind of forces big changes across the entire team. Yeah. Something has just seriously gone awry there. Yeah. I think the, the problem is the constant change at the team. Yeah. You know? And, and the turmoil and the infighting and the outside, you know, fighting in the press versus each other. And it, it, it has, its, you know, this F1 is intense, obviously. Yeah. And the other teams see that. And they're like, hell yeah. Yeah. You, keep, you know, I I'm mean, any chink, yeah, losing Nui, doing this, you know, all these things are add up. There's no way you can get away with all this going on and not losing on performance, not taking, yeah. you know, that the eye off the ball. Yeah, the focus. Yeah. And and is it the people? I, I don't know, if, but it's definitely they need to get rid of the drama yes. and get back to racing. And yeah. I think all these things have knock on effects. And I think that's what's happening right now. I really do. Um, One of our listeners, Paul, said that maybe they don't want the championship because they lost a lot of wind tunnel time with that with the penalty on the cost over, the cost cap overspending, and they'd like to get back to be in second or third where they get all of that time back for the wind oh. tunnel to develop it. I, it's a novel idea, but I think cash is king in this game. But it's, it's an interesting yeah. point. You take your, you take your wins when you get them usually, yeah. but I mean it is an interesting idea because obviously with the changes coming up very they quickly now anything you can get to develop for that new car i'm not sure if any teams yeah. want to throw away a, a championship just to do that but you, you never know some people they're, they're yeah. pretty wacky there red bull they got some <laughs> crazy ideas hey, christian horner he's wacky yeah i just i don't yeah, see I don't, I don't i don't see them throwing away on purpose I don't but either, but they I will think, I think they're Yeah, I think their ego is too big to think Yeah. You know, right. that they can't keep winning anyway. Yeah. Right, right. Well, true. But but uh, they will enjoy that increased wind tunnel time. That is for sure, because they had such that penalty um, that they need the wind tunnel time for 2026. So we'll see. Um, let's talk about Aston Martin. Lance Stroll. Ooh, boy. I want it now! Uh, a DNF. Uh, he had a DNF. Fernando Alonso P6. Lance had a puncture early on and then retired with brake issues. This is not a car, Paul. This is not a car I'm driving. I don't know what it is, but it's not a car. 
Yeah, meanwhile, Alonso's a, a second a lot faster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, meanwhile, Alonso's in P6. Yeah. Yeah, very tough weekend for Lance. I won't dwell on it. Let's move to Fernando. Um, Fernando made his tires last 41 laps and covered off an attack by Calapento to bring home P6. Would have been eight, but P6. Uh, he said it was a lonely race for him, but good. He said basically it came down to really good strategy, well executed pit stops, made all the difference really for him. Ended yeah. up in P six, so it was yeah. actually a decent race for him, although a lonely. One. Oh, it was a great one. As I said, yeah, sometimes the lonely race is the hardest ones. If you're fighting yeah. tooth and nail with someone, it's easy to be on top of your game, but when you're right. out there lonely, you know, lose focus. It, yeah, you lose a couple of seconds by turning off a little bit, and yeah. Colapinto's ahead of you after the pit stops. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's important, and, and if anyone's going to do it, Alonso can keep doing it. I mean, unfortunately, they've been struggling a lot, little bit, and um, so I'm surprised at the result. Yeah, honestly. right. I, I think right. that's a bit of a turnaround, and I think Alonso grabbed it by the Alonzos, as usual. Yeah, he <laughs> did, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk about Williams. Uh, did, Paul, did you have uh, on your bingo card both Williams cars in Q3 and both Williams cars in the points? Uh, negative. I didn't either. I had no idea. So. What a weekend for this team. I could not be happier yeah. for James and the whole team. You had Alex Albon in P7, Franco Calapento in P8. Um, is amazing. A, a fantastic, both of them in the points this weekend. Franco has scored more points, Paul, in the last two races than Logan did in the last two years. Oh, wow. So if that's a resounding confirmation of yeah. a mid-season driver change, I don't know what is. I know. I was just thinking in my mind, what's Logan thinking right now watching this? I know. That's going to sting, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, Franco drove a great race. The Argentinian mm -hmm. had a great race, was competitive, taking the fight to cars around him, thought he was heads up. They split their strategy. Paul boxed him super early, right? Mm -hmm. um, so he had to come back out, make his laps, la or his tires last for 41 laps too. No, that's yeah. not. That's a lot of pressure to put on a youngster like that. Sure um, is. Yeah. And uh, it was great. And I'm I'm sure, uh, Paul, he's hoping that his performance, he's got to make hay while the sun shines. I'm I'm sure he's trying to say, look, guys, I deserve a seat somewhere next year. You know? Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think there's any seats left. I don't think but, there's yeah. any left. But, uh, yeah, but he's, he did a great job. I was really proud of him. Great job. Yeah. No, it was, no it's an amazing – I mean, he did great at Monza, too. Uh, yeah. Simpler yeah, 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 yeah. track. This is not a track – you want to drive when you're a rookie Formula One driver. I wouldn't yeah, imagine right. the walls of a de collector wall, I think, in one of the practices, but shook that off and um, and got it going. So, yeah, I honestly, I he, he, he wasn't on my radar ever. No. Um, no not mine. So I didn't really know of him. I, I, you know, I keep my eye on Formula Two, but he's not one of the guys I was really focusing on. But, you know, right. it makes you question what Formula Two does for these drivers. Yeah, um, I think El Oli Behrman's had better drives in Formula One than he has in F two all season. F two, yeah, right. I mean, it's it, it always seems to be a bit of a a miss between those the jump up. You know, if you're yeah. a good in F two, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to equate to when you're in F one car or vice versa. Or right? vice versa, yeah, yeah. And so, um, obviously, Dean Vowles knows Colapinto pretty well, part of the Young Driver Academy, so knew what he was getting more than yeah. any of us did sure and and yeah it turned out to be pre pretty pretty stout pretty stout yeah. performance um to be able to he was beaten album at some point um, he was ahead of album yeah 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 and and just qualifying pace and everything like that seems to be the match of album probably the worst thing that can happen alex right now actually is to have a young <laughs> yeah. guy come in and kind right. of start matching he's like oh maybe he wasn't that special but well you know uh, argentina knows how to make world champions down there yes know. they do yeah they had a habit yeah yeah yes. it's in the blood it's in the blood down there well done argentina i think mm. it was a fantastic uh performance uh alex had a good race too ran as high as third but once he made his pit stop he was able to drive back into the points finished uh with his teammate on his tail which is a terrific result for the team and they're you know don't forget folks they're trying to take that fight to haas for p7 and the constructors and for a small team like williams that's, you know, a bunch of money that could be ten, twenty million dollars uh in yeah. prize money. So it's a big deal for James and the entire team and, and um real happy for them. I think uh 
uh, that Williams trimmed out for this track was was good. Strategy was good. Uh, splitting the strategy worked out well. I think the the team kind of hit on all cylinders. Uh, yep. But it was a good race for Alex too. Absolutely, ba- they maximized the weekend. Um, they've yeah. had some ups and downs this year, obviously. Yeah. Um, and to I think it's really Colapinto coming in and doing what he's done is probably going to really help raise. Yeah, yeah. The game of the whole the whole organization because they've been beat down quite a bit, you know. The cars crashing, they're not scoring points, blah blah blah. You know, they've got no chassis, all that kind of good stuff. Um, yeah, it's 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 all positive. So for Williams, let's hope they can they can build on it and and make the lows less low. And uh, yeah, give the, give this kid a chance. I'm, unfortunately, I just don't think there's anywhere for him to go. Yeah, I know. unless unless you know Audi want to. Bring him right. in, but um, then right. then I don't think James Vowles wants to wants to cart him off to another manufacturer either. Yeah, it's tough. I you know this is um I it's one weekend. I don't want to make a prediction on a, on a yeah. one off, but I mean, but this is you know there's that D mark line, Paul, where you've got the the Red Bulls, McLarens, Mercedes, Ferraris, and and all that. Yeah. Then there's this D mark line at midfield, and that D mark line. Um, if you look last year, Alpine was kind of playing just above that D-mark line this early this year. Aston Martin was, you know, running above that D-mark line, sure, certainly in the points, always nipping in the points, always there, thereabouts. Could be fifth to tenth anywhere. Um, Williams always at the back. Sauber at the back. Alpine now at the back. Haas kind of nipping into that ninth, tenth, mm-hmm. you know, kind of bumping into the points all season. But it's that sort of consistency. This is what you want for Williams every weekend. You yeah. want him going into the weekend, having a decent competitive weekend in the midfield, nipping into the points, you know, there, thereabouts, ninth, tenth, getting into Q2, Q3, having that consistency as they start to grow and develop that car. This is kind of where you want to see them slotted in. Whereas, with Alpine, the converse has happened. You know, they were kind of in that position, and then they drifted out. Aston Martin, kind of in that position, and they're struggling to hang in there. If it wasn't for Alonso, they wouldn't be, right? It'd be Haas. So, yeah, this is uh, – I hope they continue this. I hope this is yeah. uh sign to come. Yep. Uh, speaking of Haas, uh, you had Nico Hulkenberg, P11, Ali Behrman, and P10. Uh, Ali had a great race, even gave the position to Hulk early on, but then Nico uh, – you know, went around him and went off to his own race, but Ali was uh, feisty all day fighting, said that he lacked pace on his first stint, but then he did much better on his second stint. But when he was pushing his tires, they overheated pretty quickly and that allowed Franco to get around him, but he scored a point. Nonetheless, uh, a great result inherited, of course, but he still scored a point and that was good for him. Uh, in a great race, I think uh, just not putting it the barrier, ripping front wings off, those kind of things, yeah. um, thinks it was good. A lot of <laughs> this, uh, IO was uh, the um, the guest team boss for Sky this weekend, and they were asking, you know, well, oh, Ollie's looking really good. You know, might you know might you reconsider your decision with Kevin and just bring Ollie in mid season and give him yeah. some uh, experience of the balance of the season? He's like, oh, what are you a lawyer? You know, what are you? <laughs> It's like, uh, yeah, I'm sure Kevin's contract has some teeth in that to prevent that. I would um, think. But anyway, I thought it was a good stand-in for Ollie. Great practice, and I think he did a great job. He did, did a great job and, and gives the team, really boils the team looking for next yeah, year. For next you year. Know, the, you know, we, we saw, you know, what he did in the Ferrari, but, you know, being able to stay on toe-to-toe with, with Hulkenberg is no mean fit and scoring point. And you know, that's more than they could have asked for, quite honestly. It's probably going in, they were probably like, well, oh, just give him experience and he'll be more ready for next year. But hey, he comes back with some loot in his pocket. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's great. Uh, Nico looked competitive at the start. He passed Franco and looked set for points, but then he ran over some debris that was still on the track, damaged his front wing. That left him drifting backwards and on the outside looking in. So not a great race for Nico. Oh, but, um, the team, but the team should be. More than happy. They've been yeah. much more consistent, as you said, just knocking on the door of points, and when opportunities arise, they get them. So They're there. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly what you want yep. if you're a team trying to move forward. Uh, now, if you're a team trying to move backwards, this is... <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the 
pattern you want to follow. Yeah. Yeah. This uh, this track was uh, for Alpine. This track was not friendly. Not friendly. Um, not friendly. So what you've got is Alpine, uh, Pierre Gasly, and P12, Esteban Ocon, P15. Not a lot to talk about the team really. Like Lewis, Esteban started from pit lane. Pierre started at the back of the grid after his disqualification over fuel flow violation and qualifying. Yeah. Not good from there. They made very little progress, but Pierre ran the whole race practically on hards and then put soft on the last lap to finish P12. So that was a bold strategy. And yeah. that's how that played out for him. But tough weekend for Alpine. Yeah, very tough, very tough. You, you know, the, it's, it's, it's unfortunate when those little blips in the, mm. in the data, they go over and it was like just some part that's failing or whatever. Nothing, they're not cheating. They're not doing this and that, but the rules are the rules don't I know it, then you have to stick to them and anything that goes awry, you have to pay the penalty. But yeah, and got to turn not, your not car a... off during a pit stop. Yeah, what the hell? Stupid <laughs> rules. Stupid rules. <laughs> yeah. But Stupid uh, yeah, way. yeah. The Alpine are just, I don't know what to say about them. Oh, and I did ask folks, I did ask Paul if uh, Mohammed bin Salim has been at the WC races to personally weigh in Ian as he got out of the car. <laughs> yeah. and he has not done that yet. Oh, well. yeah. So, oh, yeah. So, you know, good news is Ian hasn't been ushered around by yeah. uh, Eddie everywhere and, and personally weighed in. Yeah, uh, probably not enough Eddie. TV at WIC. You yeah, know, not to, enough. To yeah, warrant not enough him making time. an appearance. Yeah. yeah, not enough screen time. Uh, let's see. RB, Dan Ricardo, P13, Yuki Sonoda, DNF. Same result as the last race, 13 and a DNF for RB. It's just going, you know, it's Red Bull. Yeah. If you think they're having a tough time, RB is really strong. Right, right. And I think it's probably all part of the same problem, right? But yeah, they, they, they were They were down here, so they dropped in the same amount. Yeah. They're, they're way out of the points at this point. And yeah. Ricardo, yeah. even if he was trying to head for trying to replace Sergio, this. He can't show anything right now with the car anything. they have. Yeah. No, he did the same thing Gasly did, ran forever on his first stint. Then he yeah. was hoping for a safety car, which never showed up. Then changed at the last and ended up P13. Yuki uh, had that coming together with Lance Stroll, mm -hmm. ripped off a section of his side pod. Then he, he retired the car, so not good. Uh, not good at all. Oh, no, it all went wrong. Um, let's see. Kick Sauber in the nuts. Oh, um Kicks Albert in the shin, I'll say that. Yeah. So Salbert, brutal. Uh, Valtteri Bottas in P16, Joe Guan Yu in P14. Bested the veteran Valtteri he did. Uh, the team split their strategies at Valtteri on mediums, Joe on hards for the start. Despite that, and four cars out of the race ahead of them, they still didn't score points. It's killing me, Smalls. Uh, yeah, I, I was riding along with, Bodas in the video because he was kind of right behind that incident using that. Was you know, he doing was like, oh, what man. Vettel said Alonso was doing? He was doing a bus tour of Baku? Pretty much. He was, but that car looked horrible. Did it? I mean, there's not much occasion I need to jump in the Sauber and, and see what's going yeah. on, but geez, that yeah. car had nothing going for it. Yeah, well, you know, leave Lando to say, Oh, Jesus. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah, I don't, I don't think Bottas was pushing his nth degree. You don't think he was 10 tenths, huh? I don't think so. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. Uh, at this point, I do wonder if they're going to score a, a, a single point the entire yeah. season. That's brutal. That's just yeah. brutal. Yeah. It really is. Uh, I hate it for all the team members, all the men and women who work for that team. I'm sure they're working their tails off. It's just, oh, my gosh. Yeah. So we'll see. No, no, we'll fix everything. Yep. You ask for a miracle, I give you Mattia Bonato. Um, so let's give out some awards, shall we? First award is the move of the race. Woo! Seriously, Todd. Yes, seriously. I Absolutely. think, I suspect your move and my move are the same. Was it yes. Oscar on Charles? Absolutely. Yeah, Got to do it. It's so important. Even that's though it's a, a, given. a DRS pass, technically. It was. It was a, it was a pretty dynamic like breaking move that most people can't pull off so yes it was yeah all right and next award is donkey of the race we'll do it live oh yes donkey of the race paul uh yeah. did you have perez and carlos yes sir i did too yeah, oh, I, I don't because i don't want to keep i mean i think we could rename this the uh stake f1 donkey of the race award because <laughs> i'd usually give it to them for being so yeah. hor horrendous but um 
Yeah, you've got to give it to this, how much they lost in just a split second of yeah. decision making. From podium to DNF, that's brutal. Yeah. Uh, and final word is drive of the race. <laughs> All right. Did you yeah. have Oscar? I did, but you know, oh, obviously, you've got to give it, give your honorable mentions to the young guns. You know, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Not that Oscar's old, the but he's Calipinto not old at all. And, uh, yeah, for the, the yeah, the the new guys did did an incredible job both scoring really the points. Did. So yeah, yeah, they really did. Great. Um, let's do some mailbag. You've got um, mail. Okay. Mr. Mufti asked this. He says, hello, and thanks for the podcast. Long-time listener from Saudi. Well, hey there. I uh, found myself listening to your podcast way more than actually watching the races. Wow. <laughs> okay. Good for you. I'm glad we're at least getting in. Uh, I guess maybe the older chatter at the beginning isn't, isn't yeah, as bad yeah. for some people. Yeah. He said, thanks for all the insights. Well, thank you so much for the kind words and for listening. He said, your podcast about Audi driver selection got me to thinking about the Young Drivers Academy. Are drivers, and this is really for you, Paul. I'm not a professional mm. driver. You are. Are drivers actually extensively taught how to adapt their driving style to the car characteristics? We often discuss... Which is more important, the car versus the driver? But if Max likes a pointy car, is he going to do well in another team unless he's taught to really change his driving style and can actually do it? Then maybe mm -hmm. not. Rather than rookie versus experience, I think Audi should choose drivers with identical car preferences. That way their car development benefits both drivers. What do you think, Paul? That's a tough question. Um Ultimately, you always just want the best driver you can see, is it? but you, it's not it goes beyond the fastest lap they can do. It's how they can run a weekend, you know, how they can use race craft, how they can work with the team engineering wise. Obviously with sports cars, difference is quite, quite stark between a Porsche and a Aston front engine versus mid engine versus rear engine Acuras. Some drivers have a problem going over to the other vehicles. There's no way you can drive an Aston Martin the same way you can drive an NSX. It's just not possible. And if you're a, a person that likes that feel of that car, you really have to do the ad adaptation, else you're just going to be off the pace. Um, the, and obviously, then that that is true in itself for Formula One as well. You know, the cars do handle different. The engine performance is different. All, all the cars design differently, even though miraculously now all, all the lap times are so so close together. It's it's making for a, a thrilling season. But it's hard to define what a driver is absolutely going to be suited for. With someone like Max, yes, you're not going to invite him to the team and tell Max to, you, yeah, but this car doesn't doesn't point very well, but it makes it up in this and this and this. So you need to adapt. You're not going to do that. You're you need to enhance the best that that driver can be and try and make the car work the car as well as it can be towards what is their best assets. Right, so um, to you get. I also in the think team. of Paul like a, a guy like Alonzo. You remember yeah. how he used to just jam him in, but then yeah, yeah, he radically changed his driving approach. Whereas I think Daniel Ricardo has struggled more so with these this era of cars and adapting his driver's style versus what Alonzo's been able to do mm -hmm. and adapt his style. So is that kind of is that sort of driver dependent that ability and to have that Absolutely. adaptability, it's driver specific. Some drivers just have it, some don't. Yeah, some 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 drivers have that adaptability. They can read it. I mean, Alonso's you know big brain on on Brad. You know, I mean he he can he can see what the car needs before anyone can tell him what it needs, and then starts adapting to it. Um, and some drivers can't can't do that. And it's as I said, it's hard to know till you get into the team, looking from the outside in. There's no way of knowing how these drivers work within a team and how they're engineered. Sometimes I've seen drivers come and they're like, you don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, right. yeah, you can drive right. a car fast, but you're not an asset in the engineering department in the debriefs, <laughs> right? right. Uh, give, right. Give, give him a gun and he'll shoot the, bull, the bullseye. But other than that, you know, he doesn't know how to load it, you know? Yeah, so, right. Right. Um, yeah, so it, it's, you're not going to be hiring dry, the, the the level of driver you need, there's not enough of them to then pick, oh, well, you're a, a person that likes this kind of car, so we'll have you. Mm -hmm. um, but 
yeah, that's yeah. So it, there's there's a lot of back and forths on the on this question. It's a great question, a really great yeah. question. Yeah, but ultimately, is. every driver, every team will try and get the best possible driver they can, and then try and make that car work to get, make their assets as, as honed and and um, ex, exploit them as best they can as well. And in that case, you think of Red Bull as a good example of two drivers of two different pretty different driving styles yeah. how the car favors max and it's very pointy and and sergio yeah. may not like that right and sergio has struggled to get on top of that or to have, find the adaptability i think that's difficult you know yeah, for, it for is. some drivers and so then you've got that disparity between them yeah because um, the best driver on the team is going to lead the engineering yeah um yeah. And, and and I think I I heard something like Sergio was not going to be focusing on what Max does as much and maybe focus on himself, which is probably the best thing he can do, really. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Great question. Um, next up is Matt. Matt asks us, hey, Paul and Todd, thanks for the podcast. Been listening since September 2010. Wow, Matt. That's awesome. Uh, Thank you. He said, I think. That's a but long time. It is a long time, <laughs> a very long time. Uh, that's too long to listen to me, honestly. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, note reminder, this question is before the Baku Grand Prix. Do you think Lando is turning into a Coulthard and Oscar Amica? I just worry that he may not have the ultra ruthless streak. Um, he's a wet nurse, laugh out loud. Uh, anyway, can't wait for the review, Matt. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Do you I, think Lando's I turned into a Coulthard? No, I don't no? see it. I don't think he's cut of that cloth. Um, it may mean he can't drive with Oscar. Maybe there has to be a decision move. made at some point. Yeah, move to put him himself in a better position if he thinks Oscar's, you know, somehow taken taken over the the team somehow. But I, I can't imagine Lando ever going down to that level. I think he's too good. I I, I know. We say Piastri is my choice if I had to choose between the two, but I, I, that doesn't mean Norris can't win a world championship in the right place, right time, right. and maybe a different team. Right, but it's a bit like Highlander. You know? There can only be one. <laughs> <laughs> I know his name. Um, yes, I agree. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out, but I think there's enough dragon inside Lando. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw him when he came in, and he's the impish sort of, you know, jokester and all that, and he's a markedly different Lando now. Yeah. And I think in a couple of years' time, he'll be even a markedly yeah. different. And, and it's easy us for me. We, we were making decisions on what happened the last race. You know, look yeah, at the yeah. – Lando's had some pretty damn impressive oh, yeah. drives. Very and impressive. So yeah, so you, you got to look yeah. at the big picture. But yeah, it's yeah. so he's, he's the he's real thing. He's the real thing for sure. He yeah. is the real thing for sure. Um, so anyway, a great question. All right, well that does it for this podcast. That's what we think about this race. Now Paul and I are going to be in Indianapolis this weekend, Woo. and we're going to try to squeeze in the Singapore Grand Prix and uh, and have a review. Yeah. So this should be fun. Um, and while I'm there, I'll try to post pictures and fun content on our social channels. So be sure to watch that this weekend from the IMSA race at uh, Indianapolis. If you're going to be in Indianapolis for the IMSA race, be sure to come by and say hi to Paul because I'll be following him around like a puppy dog. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I need to go to the Get bathroom, off. Paul. Get off. <laughs> and, Go see uh, Roger. Roger needs you. Go Roger. Go to Roger. <laughs> Go Roger. Roger wants to talk to you. <laughs> yes, he wants to wish you a happy birthday. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, we'll be doing that. But if you uh, if you like this podcast, be sure to give us a good rating on favorite players. Spread it with your friends. Share it. Uh, promote it. We'd be incredibly grateful for your help in that. A huge thank you to all of our Patreon supporters for all of the support you give us. Could not, would not do this podcast without you. You can go to our website and become a patron supporter. Go to thepartforme.com. And on the right-hand side, and I think even down at the bottom, you can click on that and you can become a supporter. And if you do that, you can join us in our live audiences when we record on Monday nights here in the U.S. So a huge thank you to all of you for your support. And, Paul, I guess in a few days I'll see you in Indy. That's right. It's going to be exciting. Hopefully, hopefully the media room has better nachos than uh, Daytona for you. 
Paul and I got hooked up at Daytona 24. We were in the media center eating hot dogs that have been there since uh, last January. Since <laughs> and, Richard Petty lost one of his NASCAR races. Right, in a Plymouth. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then the nachos have been sitting under a heat lamp for about three years. <laughs> it was brutal, man. Yeah. <laughs> but we were starving. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, my gosh. It was terrible. Yeah, So, it was. yeah, I hope Indy is a little better. But yeah. uh, anyway, all right. Well, be sure to watch our social channel uh, over the weekend hopefully uh Paul, well, paul's got he'll be working but i'll be trying to i'll be trying to take pictures in real time action shots of paul running and working i'll be trying to get yeah. that but uh anyway should be fun all right until next week when we do it all over again this is todd aka negative camera saying so long that's it man game over man it's game over